I think we're just going to wait for a few, maybe two or three more minutes. Let let uh, Dr. Kuvion just just finishing up with the patient, so she's going to be joining us in a second. All right, guys, we're starting in just a minute or so. Dr. Kuyan is about to pull up the slide deck and we'll get started, everybody. Thanks for hanging in there with us. It looks like Dr. Kuyan is on. Hi guys, good evening. Do you have co-hosting available accessibility now, Dr. Kubion? I'm just waiting on the ability to share my screen. I made you host, so that should allow you to share your screen. Okay, great. Yeah, here we go. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining this evening. Uh, Dr. Lane and Dr. Kivion, we'll take it from here. So good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us for tonight's talk on your guide to psoriasis. I thought we'd do a couple of quick introductions about myself and Dr. Lane. So I'm Dr. Ted Lane. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Sonova Dermatology. Uh, we have practices in Texas and Louisiana. I'm also Executive Director of our research arm where we have practices and locations in Texas and, and um, well, just in Texas actually, in Austin, Dripping Springs, and Houston. 
Uh, and Dr. Kuvion is our medical director at uh, SBA Dermatology, where she practices, Dr. Kuvion. So I practice here at our Houston location. I practice medical and cosmetic dermatology, and I'm also a principal investigator for our clinical trials and research is something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. It's something that allows us to develop and participate in development of new treatments for our patients. And it's something that I, I really get a lot out of. Um, and psoriasis is a really big part of my practice. And so happy to be here tonight to talk to you guys about um, what this condition is and what the treatment options are and some opportunities that our clinic can offer you as far as treatment for this. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what is psoriasis. So this is an immune mediated disease that affects a lot of people. In the United States, we have over 3% of our patient population that are affected, which is over seven and a half million people. And what does this mean being an immune mediated disease? So our immune system that normally is fighting infections, fighting viral infections, bacterial infections, surveying our bodies for cancer, in certain conditions, it can kind of be turned up um, and that inflammation can show up on the skin like these pink or red scaling plaques, we call them. Um, this can show up mostly on the skin, but about a third of people who have psoriasis can also develop psoriatic arthritis or uh, joint stiffness and swelling that can be associated with this. So this upregulated immune activity in the skin, so this affects the way the skin grows out and normal skin cell maturation it takes over a month for a skin cell to be new and then grow out normally and make this nice compact skin that we're used to seeing. And in psoriasis, that process happens in only a few days, which is why we see Le this cahier? Y a pas de problème. Um, pas, there's a couple of different subtypes that we see with psoriasis. The most common is the plaque type, which I've been describing. And that you could see in, um, you could see in the pictures that I showed you on the previous slide. There's a subtype called guttate psoriasis. So guttate means raindrop. And when you have this, you can have really tiny little spots that can occur all over the body. There's a pustular variant. This can happen on the body or more commonly on the palms and soles. And we also have inverse psoriasis where the psoriasis can occur in the body folds and the armpits and the belly button and the genital area. And when we see it in that area, because that those areas are more subject to being warm and moist, being in a body fold, they don't have these classic scaling plaques that we see. They're more pink areas that may have scale, maybe a little kind of like wet or moist macerated scale. Um, so symptoms associated with psoriasis, you can have flaking and scaling, redness, itching and pain. Um, there can be nail changes associated with psoriasis things like pits, which are tiny little divots you can see in the nail, almost as if you took an ice pick and made a little divot. Oil spots or, or salmon patches, these are small little coloration abnormalities on the nail or even lifting of the nail, which we call distal onycholysis. And you can have joint stiffness and swelling. When we look at psoriasis, we generally rate it in terms of severity, both on how thick the plaques are how and how much is involved in the body. And then also looking at special sites that are a little harder to treat like scalps and genital areas. So what causes this? Um, and the answer is we really don't know. We think we have some idea of what causes this. Um, we have some combination of a genetic predisposition, um, but for most people, there's not a specific gene defect that's been isolated, but you may have family members who have psoriasis. And also different components of the immune system are at play. Over time, we have isolated specific molecules that seem to be more responsible for triggering psoriasis. Among those are things called TNF-alpha, IL-23, IL-17. Um, but this can happen um, to anyone. It occurs in, in children and adults. It occurs in men and women, but most commonly it shows up between the ages of 15 and 25. And this is something that's not contagious. Um, you can't catch psoriasis from somebody else. This is something that you probably had an innate tendency to have on your own. And then maybe environmental factors or inflammatory factors or trigger contributed to it showing up when it did. Um, but we do know that it's a sort of chronic condition that can wax and wane over time. So often we're looking at treating psoriasis. We're trying to develop a plan that is something that's very sustainable over time is because the condition will stick with you over your lifetime. 
Um, so what causes, so I mentioned triggers. So a triggering event can sometimes result in the onset of psoriasis. So a change in the immune system can sometimes make the first time it appears, make it show up. And then triggers can also cause worsening or flaring of psoriasis. So things like stress, um, skin injuries. So a cut can sometimes result in appearance of psoriasis at that area. Infections in particular, strep throat um, can cause a new onset of guttate psoriasis, uh, but even other infections. So I've had some patients who've had the flu, who've had COVID, who've had um, you know, other illnesses and the severity of that illness kind of triggers their psoriasis. Some medicines can either bring it on or worsen it, including lithium beta blockers. Um, prednisone, which is something that um, is used for when you're sick and you have a sinus infection to treat other inflammatory conditions. And the prednisone actually temporarily makes psoriasis look a lot better, but you can have a really big flare um, when the prednisone effect wears off. So weather can be a trigger. And with weather, we think that, that we see a worsening during colder months because actually the sun has an immunosuppressive effect on the skin. And so most patients get better, especially if your psoriasis is in an area where this is exposed to the sun, so arms and legs, um, face, the, the sun or summer sun helps that. And then cooler weather, less sun, you have a little bit worsening psoriasis and then tobacco and alcohol can worsen this. Um, when possible, avoiding triggers can reduce the flares. And if a medicine is flaring it, eliminating that medication can, can make a significant impact on your ability to, to treat your psoriasis. So how do we diagnose this? Most of the time, psoriasis is a clinical diagnosis because we have these signs that we can look for. Um, so we check all of your skin, including your scalp, look closely at the nails, and ask about involvement of other areas like armpits, genitals. Um, we'll ask about joint symptoms and joint symptoms can sometimes be um, you know, easily apparent where you uh, have you know, a complaint, like, yes, I know my joints are stiff or swollen. Sometimes it can be very swollen to where they look like a sausage, um, but sometimes they're subtle. Stiffness when you wake up, taking a couple of extra minutes to get going in the morning, um, these are sometimes subtle signs of a psoriatic arthritis. If you've got blood relatives who have psoriasis, asking about a family history is, is very helpful. And also looking for any of those triggers that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, so many times we can make a diagnosis based on all these things together, but sometimes it's not completely clear. Sometimes psoriasis doesn't come, um, just like a textbook. And so we'll make a small biopsy, which is when we take a tiny piece of skin and look under the microscope, and that can be helpful in making the diagnosis. So this can affect all of the areas. So I mentioned some of the common areas, but truly all of our skin are potential areas for involvement with psoriasis. So I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Lane so we can talk a little bit more about comorbidities and how we treat this. Thanks, Megan. I mean, Dr. Kuvion just did a wonderful job at uh, giving us an overview of psoriasis as a disease state. Um, certainly, as she mentioned, you know, we show pictures of what most people's psoriasis looks like, but as she also said, some people's psoriasis just doesn't follow what the textbook says it should look like. And so there are cases where we need to do little biopsies to understand if, if the rash that our patients are experiencing is, is it psoriasis or is it something different? So if you come in and we have to do a biopsy, don't be upset about that. That can happen. Okay, um, there we go. So comorbidities, these are conditions that can be associated with psoriasis, obesity, heart disease, diabetes or pre-diabetes, and depression. And so we know that psoriasis causes inflammation on the skin, right? You see that. You see the rash that's inflamed and red and scaly, but we also know that the same chemicals that are in your blood that are leading to the inflammation in your skin are causing inflammation internally. And that's what we see with the heart disease and the diabetes, depression, high cholesterol can also happen. Stomach issues can happen. And of course we mentioned, or Dr. Kubian mentioned the joints. So psoriasis is not just a skin disease. It's a systemic disease that affects your entire body. And so therefore, when we start thinking about how we're going to treat psoriasis, we really don't just think about the skin. We understand as dermatologists that, that while we believe the skin is the most important organ of the body, of course, 
the uh, other organ systems are affected as well. And so we think about treatments that can help not only your skin, but also what's going on internally as well. Um, I don't know if I have control. Do I have control, I guess? No, I'm sorry, I do. Okay, thank you. So it's important to see your primary care doctor to screen for other health conditions um, that can be associated with psoriasis. In other words, you really have to take control over your health when you have psoriasis because we know other conditions can be associated with it also. Okay. So how do we treat psoriasis? Well, first of all, doing what you're doing right now, understanding the disease, getting as much information as possible. These kinds of webinars are great. I often direct my patients to uh, the National Psoriasis Foundation has a website, psoriasis.org or .org is a great tool to learn more about psoriasis and also to learn more about uh, the latest treatments for psoriasis and the latest data on uh, our understanding of psoriasis. Uh, but when you come in and we talk about your psoriasis and we take a look at you, if you have very limited disease, if you have just a small amount on your skin, we don't see any signs of, of joint involvement, um, you, you are seeing your primary care doctor, we very well could just treat it with a topical medication like a cream, for example. We may advise that you use um, special light therapy. This is either a laser that we have in the office that uses a certain wavelength that decreases inflammation in the skin that can be used two or three times a week to help get your psoriasis under control. And that's often covered by insurance. Or it's a light box that we may have in the office where if you have more psoriasis on your body, we'll have you come in two or three times a week and stand in a box that emits a certain wavelength of light that decreases inflammation as well. So it's not all about systemic medications. There are certainly opportunities for us to treat your psoriasis with either creams or light therapy. Uh, and then as we move on, if you have if your body is more involved with psoriasis, if there's more than just a few patches, we may then start talking about, look, it's gonna be difficult for you to, to treat your psoriasis topically with the cream. You may have too much on your body to really keep up with it. Now it's time for us to start talking about other types of medications. And there are pills that we can use. And there are these other medications called the biologic medications. And these are the ones that you see on TV a lot, right? Um, the biologic medications are either injected or infused. So most of our patients are using biologic medications that are injectable. And while that sounds scary, many of them now have these auto injectors where you really never even see the needle. You just place a pen-like device on your skin and you push a button and then everything happens without you even seeing uh, the needle. You may feel the, the medication a little bit, but otherwise it's very tolerable. And we have medications now where you may inject every two weeks or some every four weeks. And we even have medications where you inject once a quarter. Uh, and they do a very nice job of keeping your psoriasis under control, and they decrease your risk of arthritis, for example, or diabetes, or high cholesterol, or heart disease. We know that as well. So we've really come a very long way in our understanding of psoriasis and also our treatment as well. And you may think, okay, so you're treating my skin. What about my nails, for example, where you see on the bottom with some of these systemic medications, they treat the nail psoriasis as well. And you can see over four months and six months how those nails look much, much better. So we can really treat the entire body with some of the medications that we have. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the treatment plan. So you'll come in first, we'll make the diagnosis. We will um, talk to you about you know, joint disease. We'll talk to you about how psoriasis affects your entire body. And then we'll decide together, because this is a collaborative approach towards treatment. We'll decide together what treatment may be best. And if we think that you have arthritis, if we think that you may have some joint disease, we may uh, ask you to see a rheumatologist who's a specialist in joint disease to help us with this arthritis and make sure we have the correct diagnosis. There's a lot of collaboration between dermatology and rheumatology on the, psori on the psoriasis patient just to make sure that we're giving you the best treatment available. So don't be surprised if there's a few doctors involved, including your primary care doctor, uh, just to make sure you're getting the best care plan available. Let's go to the next one. So remember, we're trying to help you see clearer skin. We know that the psoriasis causes uh, embarrassment for a lot of people. It can limit your social interaction as well. It can increase your risk of depression or anxiety. We are very aware of the need to get your skin clear and we have the tools and the medications to do that. 
We want to make sure it doesn't get more severe, uh, especially in terms of the joint disease. Remember, psoriasis that affects the joints can actually destroy the joints over time. And so we want to make sure that we are limiting that joint involvement so that we don't, it doesn't lead to long-term disability of that joint and pain as well. Psoriasis can often itch. Sometimes it's painful. So the last thing we want is for you to have a skin rash that is so itchy or painful that you can't sleep at night, or you can't do your, your daily activities or, or your work. So we'll work with you to decrease the itch and the pain involved with psoriasis. And then of course, as we mentioned a couple of times, we wanna make sure that we're decreasing the systemic inflammation because we, we know that other organ systems are involved. Okay, let's go to the next one. But there are things that you can do as well, right? There's, there's certain things that we can use with our medication and our, uh, all of our knowledge, but there are things that you can do at home. So, so you can make sure that, that you're not addicted or overusing alcohol or tobacco. Uh, you can get screened for other autoimmune diseases, such as Crohn's disease, which is a disease of the, of the intestines. You can get screened for diabetes and make sure your high blood pressure is under control. Um, you can get screened for eye, certain eye diseases, even gum diseases associated with um, psoriasis. So you get the idea from this list that psoriasis affects almost every part of your body. You can maintain a healthy weight. That's a, very important for psoriasis. We know that patients who maintain a healthy weight and have a good BMI have, have much easier time controlling their disease. Eating a balanced diet, eating a non-anti-inflammatory diet, for example, also helps to control the psoriasis. Exercising regularly not only helps you psychiatrically, psychologically, physiologically, but it also helps to, to get your um, psoriasis under control. And of course, getting good care, seeing a dermatologist regularly will help keep your psoriasis under control as well. Let's go to the next one. Megan, so I'm gonna, actually, before we move on a little bit, I um, said I had a question for you um, about this question. So, you know, I, I think that it's great when you want to kind of try to take control and do all the things that you can to try to control your psoriasis. Um, but I find doing these things can help us not have flares, but I think it's really important to understand that it's not going to cure the psoriasis. And I feel like that's so disappointing to my patients to hear. I don't know if you have a discussion a lot with your patients, do you probably do? You know, um, Dr. Kimion, that's a great point. I think that a lot of patients think that they are at fault for their psoriasis and that if they were to change some parts of their personality or some activities that they're doing, that they will cure it. And I mean, that's just a great point for us to bring up in that you're not at fault, right? Your psoriasis is there either because of your genetics or because of another condition that we just don't understand with your immune system. So there is nothing that you are doing that is causing the psoriasis per se, but there are things that you could do to help us get your psoriasis under control. Yeah. And so that's what the goal is of this slide. And certainly not to lay blame at anybody's feet. It's just to say, look, there are things that you can do to help yourself. And, and much the same can be said about acne or other skin conditions where Patients think maybe their skin is dirty or they're doing something that causes their acne, whereas really it's a skin condition that you just have. So great point, Dr. Kubia. Thank you. Yeah, I wish we could just cure it with diet. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about clinical research. So um, at AICR, which is the name of our clinical research division for our clinics, both in, in Austin and Pl in Pflugerville here in Houston. Um, so at the AICR, which stands for Austin Institute for Clinical Research, we are dedicated to clinical research, innovating new therapies, making sure that our patients have access to not just the clinical trials, but the benefit of the outcomes, which are hopefully that we have more and more options to control conditions like psoriasis. Um, so what does this mean? Clinical trials are how new medications come to the market and get their FDA approval. And when you're a participant in one of these trials, you have access to the dermatologist if you meet the criteria. Your visits are free, um, labs are free, and you get compensated for your time. And so these often end up being good for everybody because you help develop new therapies and often get to have the access to new therapies yourself. Um, so we offer these at our, our sites. 
Um, and we have different trials that are going on at these different sites, some that last a few months, some that last years. And we actually do, so other than psoriasis clinical trials, we do them for other medical indications, developing new therapies for atopic dermatitis, for acne, for precancerous growth, for skin cancers, and also for cosmetic purposes too. Um, so these are sometimes things that if you feel that you have, are looking for what's new or you want to contribute to the body of science and development of new things, you might be interested in being a part of one of our clinical trials. We have a website listed here, atxresearch.com. Um, we can learn a little bit more about what we do as a whole, but we wanted to share with you some of our upcoming clinical trials for psoriasis. Um, so this first one that I wanted to talk about is use of a biologic, which is an injectable medicine. And I know we didn't get too much into the nitty gritty of all the different biologics that are out there, um, but biologics to me, to Dr. Ted, sure, I'm sure too, to our patients, are life-changing for the right patient because they can allow you to live your life largely like you don't have psoriasis, which is amazing. Um, so in this trial, it's comparing one that is tried and true that we've had around for a long time, and they've developed something called a biosimilar, which is kind of like a generic. So the generic version of this tried and true medicine. And so everyone in the trial gets treated but they're looking at, can we switch you from the regular to the generic and continue to get a good outcome? Um, so this could potentially be a good one to be a part of, and we're doing this one at both of our sites. So you could do this one with me or with Dr. Lane. Um, you get compensated for your time and for your travel. And again, there's no placebo group. So that one is a, a cool one um, to potentially be a part of. Yeah, you know, uh, Dr. Kubian, I think this is a really interesting study because Everybody gets free medication. It absolutely uh, is something that's either been around, as you said, for, for years and is tried and true and something that we prescribe every day. And now it's at the end of its patent life and, and now generics can come out. And so this is what we're seeing here, whether how well the generic works when you transition from the brand name to the generic, much like you would do if you had high blood pressure medicine that you got one day, you got the high blood pressure brand name, and then you were transitioned to the generic. Uh, that's what this trial is seeing. So it's unusual for us to get a trial where you get 16 months worth of free medication. Uh, and so this is a great opportunity for patients who maybe either don't have insurance or what we call underinsured, which means you do have insurance, but maybe you don't have great drug coverage. And so these medicines could be really expensive for you. Um, so really great opportunity for our psoriasis patients. Uh, I'm excited about this trial. Yeah, me too. So this next one that we have um, is for somebody who has mild psoriasis. Again, these are ones that we're doing at both of our sites. And this is treatment with a cream that is already FDA approved for the treatment of psoriasis. Um, but we're looking at using it for mild psoriasis. So mild psoriasis means a smaller amount of the skin or thinner plaques. And again, this has no placebo group. So I find these are particularly gratifying to play a role in because everyone gets better. <laughs> um, so that, that's always really nice. This is a 28 week um, study. And again, you get compensated for your time and travel. And these little QR codes, I, I didn't mention this on the previous slide, but if you are not familiar with how a QR code works, if you pull up your smartphone and you go to try to take a picture, of, the smart, of this QR code, it will actually open up the option to our website and that sends you directly to our research website so you can get a direct link basically to what I'm talking about. Oh, and there's little instructions. And then finally, so this last one that I wanted to talk about is a really interesting trial. So this is more of an observational study. And you were hearing Dr. Lane talk earlier about how we choose therapy is based on what's going on with each patient. So how much psoriasis is there? How severe is it? Does it involve a special area that's harder to treat with skin-directed therapy like scalp or genitals? Is there psoriatic arthritis? Is there other signs of systemic inflammation? So we take all of that and then also other individual factors of the patient or their family history and all those things together we are making a clinical judgment of what's the best biologic to start with. 
And there's probably variability among dermatologists because there's a lot of really good options. Our toolbox has grown. And in many cases, our first choice does great. The patient's doing well, they're clear or almost clear, um, you know, no problem. There are these occasional times when the first choice of biologic just isn't a good fit for the patient. And what would be amazing, or what we'd love to have is a test. If we could scrape your skin or do a blood test and know this is the right patient, the right drug for this patient. And so this study is hoping to do that. So it involves coming in and you, you can see your dermatologist and make the treatment plan that's right for you. So you're choosing your medicine. Um, and this is mostly looking at patients who are wanting to start a systemic. So an oral medicine or an injectable medicine, but you get to make that discussion, make, have a discussion with your doctor, make the choice. And this wants to just track these different inflammatory molecules on your skin before and after your treatment. So I'm really excited about this because I feel like this could let me say not just, okay, this is based on my judgment, but then I have this really specific tool to say that this group of biologists is going to work best for you so that we don't have those one-offs where someone's trying a therapy and not having a full response. So pretty cool. And the skin scraping, um, by the way, is not a biopsy. It is literally a sterile little blade and we just scrape a little bit off. So not painful. Um, and easy to do. And typically for something like this, it would be easy. Yes. If you, if we were already seeing you as a medical patient, we would probably just see each other for both the screen scraping study and for medical, but you would also be eligible if you're in Houston and you have another dermatologist, we'd be happy to have you here or at our Austin site, same thing, um, where we can kind of time the visits together, or we'd be happy to have you if you're seen as a patient somewhere else. But I think this is, this is really exciting for the future of our, our treatment selection. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to hand it over back to Dr. You, Ted. Okay, so we shared with you kind of what we know in terms of why psoriasis occurs. We shared with you kind of the different treatment, broad categories of treatment options. We've also gone through some of the trials that we have available, uh, some of which are, are injectable medications. One is a cream medication. The other one is, is truly just to help us in the future by figuring out which uh, medicine would be right for which patient because of these uh, skin scraping studies. But now I just want to share some skin tips. I mean, I appreciate you, everyone being on board. I think there was a lot of education, but here's some other skin tips for you as well. Because psoriasis can occur in areas of trauma, whether it's from a, a cut or a scrape, Obviously, try to avoid that as much as you can because that can reduce your incidence of psoriasis. You don't want to get sunburn either. Any kind of insult or injury to the skin can make psoriasis work. You want to treat your psoriasis. You don't want to just ignore it because A, it can get itchy at any time, but B, one plaque can lead to two, three, or four, or even more plaques. You want to try and get that under control as best as you can. And then scratching tends to worsen psoriasis, again, because of that constant injuring of the skin. So you want to try and stop scratching the psoriasis. So easy to say, but so difficult to do. So how do you alleviate the itch? Well, cold helps to decrease itch. So using a cold complex, cold compress um, medication that, that dermatologists use. And so a lot of times we'll use a, a topical steroid medication. Steroid does a wonderful job of decreasing inflammation quickly, but it's not something that we can use for the long term. So there are other medications that we have that we can transition you to if we start with the steroid to get it quickly under control. Another medication we can use to keep it under control, for example, and that's why we say treat your psoriasis. We have great options and then moisturize. A lot of times people with psoriasis also have dry skin. If you moisturize your dry skin, especially as we're moving into the colder and drier winter months, it's funny to say colder in Texas, but anyway, drier winter months, uh, it's important to get into the habit now of using a lotion on your skin. It wouldn't be a bad idea to start a lotion now when it's still a bit humid. And as we get drier and drier transition to a cream, remember a lotion is water-based, cream is oil-based. And so cream is appropriate for dry skin in the winter months. Best time is before you go to bed for sure. Uh, after you shower in particular, you can try and trap that humidity and that moisture into your skin with a, with a moisturizer. But before you go to bed, since most itching does occur or worsen at night, moisturizing uh, before you go to bed can help with that. Let's go to the next one. Oh, 
Okay. Well, listen, I want to thank everybody for giving us some of your time. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Kuvia, for all the great uh, education that you provided as well. I wanted to see if we had, yeah, if we had any uh, questions at all, um, you can put them in the chat box, please. And we'll just kind of keep an eye on that and answer them as they come up. But we are happy to answer anything that you have. So we'll just give that a couple of minutes. The chat box, I think, can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. Am I right there, guys? Yeah, so thanks, everybody, for coming. Really appreciate you spending your early part of your evening with us. And hopefully you learned something new or maybe felt even empowered if you're not already seeking treatment from a dermatologist. Come, come and see us, see your local dermatologist, but we can help. Yeah, definitely. Oh, we've got one, Dr. Kivian, what are the risks of biologics? And then, well, and then the next one is really kind of part of that. Do biologics suppress your immune system, making you vulnerable to other issues? You so, wanna take the first one? Sure. So with biologics, so we're using the word biologics to refer to overall the group of medicines that are injectables and specifically biologics um, refers to like products that are proteins that mimic the body. Um, when we look at biologics for psoriasis, what these are doing is targeting, I think of it like different switches in the body that are turning on different parts of the immune system. Um, and we kind of look at a few main switches for psoriasis. So they're injectables and the most common risk of injectables are injection site reactions. So that, that's the most common thing that we see. Um, and overall, the reason that we use these medicines, so there are some small risks, but for most people, the disease is so much worse than the biologic and the amount of quality of life that they're able to get by using these drugs uh, makes these small risks acceptable. And we also mitigate them by um, screening you for certain things and by watching how your response is over time. Um, so probably the first class of biologics that came out, they're called TNF alpha inhibitors. They are, I think of them like as an earlier switch in the immune system and they have, they're somewhat immune suppressing. You can have a slight increased risk of getting viral infections or viral reactivations. But when you look at these infections, they're not increased in severe infections that would cause hospitalization. Um, they can also be associated with a slight increased risk in certain types of skin cancers. Um, but our newer versions of biologics are a little more targeted to specifically that inflammation that's going on with psoriasis and can significantly reduce some of these earlier risks. I don't want to necessarily get into too much of the nitty gritty with everybody here. I don't know if um, everybody is, is interested in going all the way down this, but <laughs> so they, they do have some risks that those are the main ones. Um, when we talk about doing these, um, these different medicines, so we talk about comorbidities. So some people aren't a good candidate because of the other things that are going on. And we also check some labs to, to make sure that it's safe to do. Um, but again, overall, because the risk is so low and they're so life-changing, that's why we use these medicines, you know? Yeah, I think, I think kind of the, the elephant in the room is, is whether being on a biologic increases your risk of the COVID virus. And Honestly, we, based on the data that we have, um, we don't think it does actually. Um, and it, if you are in a biologic and you do get infected with the COVID virus, the course of the disease is not worsened because you're on the biologic. So that is something that we, we are very happy to discuss with our patients because that was great news. Um, we certainly do encourage uh, vaccination, not live vaccinations. And of course, the COVID vaccine is not a live vaccine. Uh, so you can get your flu vaccine. You can get your COVID vaccine, for example. Uh, so so that, that is okay. Uh, next question, are there any treatments available during pregnancy? The answer to that is yes. Um, certainly light therapy, for example, is available. Certain topical medications can be used. And even there is, uh, there are certain biologics that are safer to use during pregnancy. And I would encourage you to, to visit your dermatologist to discuss that. Uh, but the answer is yes, there, there are treatments available during pregnancy. Um, Megan, what do you think the risks of long-term topical steroid usage are? So I think we have to tease out the difference between using topical steroids on psoriasis plaques and on normal skin because they're not the same. So 
use of topical steroids on normal skin, you can face skin atrophy is the main thing, which means thinning of the skin and stretch marks. Um, used over small areas, typically there's not what's called systemic absorption, meaning like absorption into your bloodstream, but used over a long, a, a larger area of the body, you can have some systemic absorption. Um, but the way that I think about it, and Dr. Lane had mentioned this earlier, when you have a new flare, often we're using topical steroids because a new flare is a thickened plaque. And so your overall risk of getting stria or getting skin thinning using that are very, very low. Um, and that's why we'll use topical steroids and try to use a strong enough steroid. So I also run into this, a lot of patients like, oh, well, I'll do a steroid, but I want to do a low strength steroid. I think it's really important that you match the right steroid to what's going on in the skin, because sometimes using the right strength is almost like having enough water to douse the fire and then you need less water overall. So I, I kind of use that analogy a lot where we want to really extinguish the fire, treat the psoriasis and then treat initially, and then get on a non-steroid, um, like a calcineurin inhibitor or calcipatrine, something like that. Yeah. Different options to, to yeah. make sure that we don't have long-term topical steroid usage. That's exactly right. These are great questions, everybody. Oh, oh you're very welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Well, I think, um, you know, thank you everybody. As, as we mentioned there, we've got a couple of uh, options for clinical research, uh, both in Austin and in Houston. Uh, in Houston is where Dr. Kubion is the medical director in Austin, I'm the medical director of our research site. Certainly we both practice medical dermatology as well. And we'd love to see you. Uh, and there are the numbers there, but we certainly appreciate everybody's time this evening. And if you can, just take one thing away. My one takeaway, Dr. Kubian, is that, is that you can control your psoriasis and, and, and allow the dermatologist to help you on that journey. Yeah, I'm with you. I feel like I, that was so perfect. I don't want to mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a very good evening, and we appreciate your attendance. Yeah, thanks, y'all. Good night. Good night.